I'm currently on a business trip, and I hope you considered that before calling me. I apologize that May is hurt and wants to see her daddy. I've explained to her numerous times that I'm away on a trip, but she doesn't seem to listen. However, what does she have to do with our conversation? It's concerning that you called me while I was working. May got hurt because you weren't looking after her properly. I'm sure it's just a minor injury, so please calm down and don't worry. Her life isn't in danger, is it? Please refrain from calling me while I'm working under any circumstances. If that's all, I'm hanging up because I'm in the middle of an important meeting. I couldn't understand why he wouldn't listen to me, especially when there was an emergency involving our own daughter. Look, Mommy, why is Daddy on TV? So that's what this is all about. I'm furious and determined to confront him after seeing him on television. When I saw the footage on TV, I made up my mind to seek revenge on my husband. May deserved to have her father by her side during the crisis, and neither of us deserved his behavior. He was going to pay, and he was going to pay dearly. My name is Kimberly O'Driscoll, and I'm 32 years old. I work in an accounting office for a sporting goods company. I live with my husband, Dexter, and our three-year-old daughter, May. I met Dexter six years ago at work when I approached him with a business partnership proposal. We worked well together, and our professional relationship gradually turned into personal outings. About a month after we started working together, Dexter confessed his feelings to me. We had a lot in common and enjoyed each other's company, so I decided to give our relationship a chance. After two years of being together, he proposed, and we eventually got married. A year later, I became pregnant, and May came into our lives. Dexter was over the moon when he found out about the pregnancy. He danced a little when he came home that day after I shared the news. His excitement reassured me that he would be a loving and involved father. May was the cutest thing I had ever seen. She truly became the apple of our eyes. I could spend hours just watching her sleep and marveling at her movements. Being a first-time parent, it was a joyful and rewarding experience for both Dexter and me. After May turned one year old, I returned to work. I had taken maternity leave and the company allowed me to work shorter hours to accommodate daycare arrangements. Although the shorter hours were challenging for my job, the motivation to do my best came from May and Dexter. However, when I resumed work and May started going to daycare, Dexter's behavior took a sudden turn. Instead of greeting his daughter and spending time with her, he would immediately retreat to his room to work whenever I brought work home. He even started having dinner alone in the living room and going to bed early. Our conversations became scarce, and we spent less and less time together. He claimed he had to work overtime due to a new policy at his company, allowing employees to come home only 23 times a month at fixed times. As a result, May rarely saw her daddy on weekdays. Daddy hasn't been around much lately, has he? I miss him. I'm sorry, darling, but daddy is working hard for both of us. I know you miss him, but please be patient and play with mommy for a while, okay? But on his next day off, we're going to the aquarium, right? That's so exciting. I'll be a good girl until bedtime, mommy. During Dexter's next scheduled day off, which happened to be a three-day weekend, he promised to take us to the aquarium as a family outing. May had been eagerly looking forward to the weekend trip, but on Friday, Dexter informed us that he couldn't go anymore due to work. He explained it was a business trip and that he would be staying overnight. I couldn't help but find it unprofessional for him to prioritize work over our well-deserved family time. I questioned why I was being held responsible when he had no other choice but to go. As we argued, May approached us, and upon hearing the news, she started to cry. It was understandable. She had been excited about the trip. Dexter apologized profusely and promised to bring back something special for her. However, May didn't seem appeased. Despite his apologies, she expressed her anger, saying she hated him. She decided to go to bed, leaving Dexter feeling remorseful. I tucked her in, wondering if her pillow would be wet with tears in the morning. The following day, Dexter embarked on his so-called business trip. It seemed odd that he appeared so enthusiastic about leaving. With May still upset, we decided to visit a nearby park to distract ourselves. Coincidentally, we stumbled upon Riley, 
a friend of May's from press school, and her father, Mr. Harding. It was a relief to see familiar faces in the park, as it had been challenging for me to entertain May on my own, considering what had been happening with Dexter. As May happily played with Riley, I sat on a nearby bench, observing the children while striking up a conversation with Mr. Harding. He shared how his wife was also occupied with work, leaving him responsible for their daughter during his days off. However, he expressed concerns about the limitations of indoor activities and wished his wife could take more time off to be with their daughter, who needed her presence. His words touched me, and I commented on his thoughtfulness. Mr. Harding appeared slightly melancholic, and when I inquired about it, he hesitated before opening up. He suspected his wife of having an affair, explaining her recent unusual behavior. Strangely enough, his description mirrored Dexter's actions. Weekends away, leaving their child in his care on weekdays, and his wife going out on her own when he reported being able to return early. It was unsettling to notice the similarities between their situations. Just as we discussed this, we heard crying in the distance. It was May's voice. I quickly turned towards the sound and saw that she had fallen off the slide, horrified by the sight. Riley was startled and crying too. I quickly rushed to her side and took her to the hospital. We said our goodbyes to Riley and Mr. Harding, assuring him that he would figure everything out in due time. He seemed worried about May, but he smiled reassured when I consoled him about his situation. At the hospital, an x-ray revealed that May's arm was broken and her leg was bruised. The doctor instructed me to give her time to rest and recover. She was in lots of pain and started to whimper pitifully. I want to see Daddy, she sobbed. I wish he was here. It wouldn't hurt so much if Daddy was here next to me. I know, I know. I'm so sorry, darling, I comforted her. May continued to complain loudly about how her daddy wasn't there for her, and she was absolutely right. Not only did she need Dexter's presence, but I also needed him. Who was going to do the shopping and cooking for dinner tonight? Shopping while carrying May with a broken arm would be tough, if not impossible. May was growing up quickly, and it was challenging for an ordinary single woman to manage grocery shopping while carrying a three-year-old. It required a lot of physical and mental strength. It was a legitimate emergency, and I worried sick about how I would handle everything. I held on to hope that Dexter might come home. Driven by that hope, I called Dexter, interrupting his work. What the hell do you want? I'm working right now, he snapped. I'm sorry, May broke her arm at the playground this afternoon, I explained. There's a lot of housework to be done. Could you maybe come home so we can have someone to look after her while I do the shopping, cooking, and vacuuming? She wants to see her daddy so badly. I told her many times that you're on a trip somewhere else, but she won't listen to me, I pleaded. No, I'm on a business trip. Did you ever stop to think about that before you freaking called me? You really believe I'm gonna come back home just because my daughter broke her arm? Think about it, honey. I can't even go shopping because she can't walk beside me. Carrying her is a very tiring thing to do. The pain's making her squirm too, so I can't leave her alone while I do the cooking. Do you hear me? Giving a damn about all that stupid nonsense. I'm working. Don't call me on the phone for that kind of... And with that, Dexter hung up on me. I had no choice but to inform May that her daddy couldn't come home. Sorry, darling. Daddy has a hard day at work, and he still isn't finished. I don't think he can come home today, I explained gently. Daddy, I miss you so much, May whimpered. I thought she was going to burst into tears immediately after she said that, but suddenly she pointed at the TV and exclaimed happily, Look, Mommy, it's Daddy, and there's Riley's Mommy. Daddy's not at work. He's having fun with a friend of his, and I want to. I wanna, I wanna play too, Daddy. Confused, I responded. What are you talking about, darling? I told you, Daddy's not here. He's at work. He's not at work, Mommy. Look at him, May insisted. Perplexed, I turned my gaze to the TV, and there he was. Dexter, walking arm in arm with a woman who was none other than Riley's mother, Mrs. Harding. It was a holiday weekend, 
and the news channel was covering a famous tourist spot. Behind the person being interviewed by reporters stood Dexter and Mrs. Harding, their arms wrapped around each other as if they were lovers. Witnessing this, all the things I had been suppressing suddenly exploded. Without wasting a moment, I hit the record button and captured the footage as evidence. Then I turned off the TV. Taking May to her room, I noticed she was happily playing with her toys, seemingly unaware of the turmoil in my heart. Or perhaps she had no idea how much she had inadvertently helped shed light on my doubts about my husband. My heart continued to race, consumed by the worst kind of unease. Watching May play happily, my thoughts raced, trying to determine what to do next. But I couldn't come up with an answer so quickly. Before I knew it, an hour had passed while I played with May, and thoughts of Dexter's betrayal consumed me. Just as I was lost in my thoughts, the doorbell rang. I went to answer the door, and there stood Riley and her father, Mr. Harding. Is she all right? That fall earlier looked pretty nasty, Mr. Harding inquired, concerned. I'm okay, Mr. Harding, May responded. My arm hurts a little, but I'm very okay. The x-ray showed a clean fracture of her arm. I'm afraid, I added. Come on, Riley. Let's go play, Mr. Harding suggested. May, using her non-injured arm, eagerly pulled Riley into the house. The timing couldn't have been more perfect because I had something important to discuss with Mr. Harding. We left the two girls in May's room to play and watch a cute children's movie. It was then that I revealed to Mr. Harding what I had discovered earlier that evening and showed him the recorded TV footage. I know this may be hard to believe, but the evidence against my wife is undeniable. It's clear that she and Mr. Harding have been having an affair for quite some time. May was just a year old when I enrolled her in daycare, and that's when my husband started coming home late and our conversations became scarce. Coincidentally, Mr. Harding also put Riley in daycare when she turned one, and around that time, Diana started behaving strangely as well. It's solid evidence against them, and I'm filing for divorce. What are you planning to do, sir? Without a doubt, I will file for divorce as well. I'm sorry for what he did to your wife. I'm terribly ashamed, and I won't blame you if you never forgive me. No, my dear Mrs. O'Driscoll, you haven't done anything wrong. If anything, I should be the one to apologize. My wife has always been flirty, while I forced myself to remain faithful. Part of me always suspected something like this would happen. In any case, we don't know who made the first move, but one thing is certain. We can't let them continue like this. As our daughters fell asleep watching the movie, Mr. Harding and I had all the time in the world to devise a plan to send them both to hell. The day of their return from their trip arrived quickly. Since it was a holiday weekend, we planned a party at my house. We told each of our partners to come to my house once they arrived at the train station. On that day, they both took the trouble to arrive at different times. Dexter brought back souvenirs for me, thinking I would like them. Thanks, honey. I'm sure Diana will be here soon. I believe you know that better than anyone. I made eye contact with Mr. Harding, ensuring that I played the part of a clueless husband. Since May and Riley had fallen asleep, we entrusted them to my parents and Mr. Harding, respectively. Eventually, Riley's mother, Diana Harding, arrived. It was then that I discovered how truly heartless Dexter was because as soon as she stepped into the living room, a look of gleeful delight spread across his face. How could he be so happy when he was about to face his downfall? We're all here at long last, the girl, the girl we've been wanting to see for quite some time now, I declared. With that, I turned on the TV, and as they saw what was on the screen, they were completely dumbfounded. Of course, they were caught red-handed in the act of cheating on their spouses. It was speechless, and rightfully so. I happened to capture footage of them having an affair, which was undeniable evidence. It was the turning point. They just happened to meet by coincidence during the business trip, right? Did you hear that, Mr. Harding? Apparently, it was a coincidence, I remarked sarcastically, emphasizing their embrace in the footage. Mrs. O'Driscoll, now it's time for your wife's excuse. But Dexter suddenly stood up and confessed, I'm so sorry. Believe me when I tell you this was all just for fun. The only person I truly love is you, Kimberly. 
I just felt distant from you since we had our daughter. I missed you, and I was feeling pretty lonely. For me, we've become close because we can relate to each other's loneliness. That's exactly the problem, I replied. Ma'am, shall we make the theme of this party divorce then? As I said that, Mr. Harding, and I presented the divorce papers. The juicy part was that they both said they didn't want a divorce. It's one thing to go on a business trip during a national holiday, but going on a trip with a woman whose daughter attends the same daycare as your own, that's a whole different level of betrayal, my good sir. How can you say that when you abandoned your own daughter, knowing she was really looking forward to going to the aquarium with her father? I questioned. Please, anything but a divorce, please, Diana pleaded. But we didn't back down, not even a single millimeter. We proceeded with the divorce. Perhaps they both gave up because they started signing the papers. I'm going to move out, and I hope you have a nice rest of your life in this fine house. I'm so sorry, Dexter admitted. And as for you, you will get the hell out of my house. I'm taking custody of our daughter, and I'm going to raise her. I can't let her grow up to become someone disloyal and unfaithful like you. I declared firmly. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Diana pleaded. Regarding child support and alimony, we'll each have lawyers to help file claims against both of you. I trust that both of you will be responsible for your actions and do the right thing. With that, I packed my belongings and headed to my parents' house. Mr. Harding also temporarily left his home, leaving the two of them behind. They may have thought they were lucky to get rid of us without having to take any action themselves, but little did they know that justice had finally caught up with them. I'm not sure how they're going to manage paying alimony, child support, and the mortgage on my house. But honestly, I don't care anymore. They're strangers to me now. Dexter's crime was pretending to be on a business trip while having an affair with Diana. The money that his job paid for his trip and stay was used dishonestly, and when this was discovered, he lost his job. But his bigger crime was his inability to understand the gravity of his actions. During interviews for new jobs, he even complained about his old company and shamelessly explained what he had done. No wonder he couldn't find a new job after everything came to light. On the other hand, the demands for alimony, child support, and the house mortgage kept piling up. Nowadays, Dexter is reportedly working tirelessly day and night at part-time jobs just to make ends meet. As for Diana, she moved into Dexter's house but was also fired from her job. Perhaps she thought that staying with Dexter, who had numerous financial obligations, would lead her to bankruptcy. So she took the easy way out and left as soon as she could. Even Diana, who now earns a decent income, struggles to make ends meet due to alimony and child support payments to Mr. Harding and alimony to me. As for me, I took my daughter and returned to my parents' house, which isn't too far away. This allowed May to continue attending the same daycare without any disruption, including her friendships. She and Riley have become very close. I'd occasionally meet Mr. Harding, and he seems to be doing well. He recently received a significant promotion. Although I might feel a bit lonely as a single parent, that won't stop me from giving my beloved daughter all the love she deserves. People might think it's impossible for a single parent to love that much, but I'm determined to live happily and do my best to provide my daughter with the wonderful life she deserves.